thanks for having me. My name is Tyler Foxworthy. I'm the chief scientist at Demand Jump. And um, so I got asked to give a talk on genetic algorithms, which frankly is a topic that I've not touched in, uh, it's, been se it's been several years, but it is a really interesting topic. Um, and rather than talk about um, using genetic algorithms to solve really complex, um, you know, multi-distributional deconvolution problems, I thought jigsaw puzzles might be a little more fun and a little more, uh, you know, pictorially interesting. So. Um, Anyway, who is, just a show of hands, who's familiar with what, genetic, with, with what genetic algorithms are and how they operate? Okay, so roughly 50%. 50, 50%. So for those of you that aren't familiar with genetic algorithms, the basic idea is that um, it, we can find ways to parameterize solutions to complex optimization problems um, with a vectorized solution that could be expressed either in terms of ones and zeros or um, integer values. And you can essentially come up with a population of um, you know, potentially thousands of random solutions. And then you have a function which evaluates their fitness for um, procreation. And then um, through a series of um, evolution and combining and swapping bits and pieces of uh, you know, genetic information, you hopefully converge to a solution to, um, to a problem. And we'll get into the mechanics of how all that works um, you know, as, we, as we go through this exercise. But, I picked the problem of uh, solving jigsaw puzzles because um, while it has a, um, at the surface level, it's like, yeah, it's a jigsaw puzzle. It can't be, can be that hard, right? Um, jigsaw puzzles are actually very complex from a, uh, from a mathematical perspective. If we think about the total number of possible combinations, even in small, and even in small square puzzles, a five by five puzzle has 25 factorial possible combinations that have to be evaluated. And depending on the various conditions of the problem, um, whether or not you have edge information or you're operating off of just a purely square puzzle or a multi-dimensional variation of a puzzle, um, you know, all of these problems can be, um, you know, are considered to be um, NP-complete. And so um, there is no trivial solution to them. And unlike, um, you know, a lot of uh, traditional classification and regression problems that a lot of people are familiar with, particularly those that work with uh, deep learning and neural nets, that um, there is no smooth differentiable error function in this in this case. There's no um, there's no gradient descent that gets us to um, to a solution, and so um, so while jigsaw puzzles seem you know seem like toy problems, they really have um, you know they have enough. There's enough meat on the bone there to really make them interesting and make them a worthwhile example. So anyway, um, and I will say just a little background. Um, the whole jigsaw puzzle concept came to me, um, oh, maybe a month or so ago. I was up in uh, northern Ontario um, with, my, with my family at the, at the lake house, and uh, there's no internet, no nothing, and all we had to do was, you know, read and play puzzles and, and that sort of thing. And I started thinking about it, because um, without, uh, without having a laptop or, or doing any real work for, you know, for a couple of weeks there, it, um, you start to get ideas, and one was like, I wonder how I would solve a jigsaw puzzle with, uh, with math. And then I started thinking, well, that would be a really fantastic interview problem for, uh, for a job candidate. And so I started thinking about it more and more and realized that, you know, there really is something there and it might be, might be fun to talk about. So, um, so we'll start out here with just the, the basic operations of how do we even generate a, a, a jigsaw puzzle um, short of going through and taking a, uh, taking a puzzle out of a box and scanning all the pieces, which sounds like way too much work. Um, I wanted a way to very uh, conveniently generate a puzzle from an arbitrary image just using Python. Uh, Scikit image is a uh, fantastic package. It's uh, related to Scikit-learn and, um, and all those uh, wonderful packages I'm sure if anybody's done machine learning with Python that are, they're familiar with. And it has a lot of convenience functions for uh, picking apart and analyzing images. So what we do is we take in an image. In this case, we just, um, I thought uh, Starry Night was interesting because it's, uh, it's clearly a pretty complex image. There's a, lot of, um, there's a lot of things going on in it, and there's a, a high degree of entropy in the, in the images, and I'll talk about why that's important um, as, we, as we move along here. But um, another important step here was that, um, so rather than dealing with um, all the, the nitty gritty of, of, of various sizing in images, um, I chose to stick with primarily square um, images and then make sure that they were um, uh, resized into a thousand by thousand grid. So we got our starry night. And then um, 
the, actually making the puzzle out of it is just a matter of um, taking, the, taking the image, decomposing it into blocks, randomly shuffle, shuffling it, and then just piecing it back together. And so this becomes our, our puzzle. And so our task is that we have random orientate, we have random orientations, we have random positions. We don't have explicit edge geometry to be able to take advantage of. So if we think about what the matching problem here is, that we're essentially having to match each one of these puzzle pieces in 800 dimensions because each side is of length 200 and we have four sides. So the overall, um, you can think of it as a jigsaw puzzle and really an extreme case, but an ex a jigsaw puzzle with 800 little, little grooves around it. Um, so this should, be, uh, this should be pretty fun. So the first part about thinking, thinking through how would we even solve this with or without genetic algorithms or having no basis for um, how we're actually gonna solve the optimization problem in the first place, we have to think about what fundamentally, what is the process of matching consist of? So we need a distance metric. We need a way to determine how close and how similar and how compatible any two images are. But it's not just as simple as looking at the image contents itself. We couldn't take these, we couldn't take this whole image, convert it into one long vector, and then try to and try to match it because the dimensionality increases even even more. So we have to have a notion of um, of edge or pairwise uh, pairwise similarity along each of the each of the possible directions on which you could match a puzzle. So if we consider um, one you know randomly chosen piece. It has a top, a right and a left, and a bottom side. And then we have to then compare with every possible piece, we have to compare each orientation separately. And so we have a, end up with a vector of, of, um, of distances rather than one single distance. And so what we do here is we define a set of convenience functions for, um, Flipping for flipping a puzzle piece, and then we compute the pairwise distances between um, the compatible dimensions. In this case, um, we use the cosine distance. Um, the cosine distance is is great for dealing with relatively high dimensional um, data structures, and um, and basically what you're doing there is you're trying to um, compute the angle, uh, this high dimensional angle between two vectors of of edges, and the what. Got it. So we're taking the pairwise, the pairwise cosine distance between these, uh, between all of these pieces, and the hope is that when we zoom in and we look just at the razor thin edge of, of an image, that that will preserve enough that a matching piece should have enough similarity preserved there, that um, that a piece that truly is a match in the right orientation will have the minimum distance. And strictly speaking, we don't call the, um, the, the pairwise uh, distances between pieces, we don't call them distances, we call them dissimilarities. Um, and that's just because that um, when you throw in the orientation piece into the, into the puzzle, it stops acting like a, like a true metric. And so we call it a dissimilarity measure. Um, another important thing about this is that you know, while we go through for every, for every piece in every position, we compute its pairwise distance, we also determine, um, because this is an ordered, this is an ordered array, we also can determine which um, position in this array corresponded with the minimum distance. And what that allows us to do is actually preserve the notion of uh, orientation, the relative orientation of puzzle pieces as well. That way, um, it's a way for us to pre-compute out a lot of the complexity so later on when we're evaluating configurations, it becomes a lookup problem rather than having to do um, a separate you know, set of, of distance calculations every single time. So that's a way for us to save a lot of, uh, save a lot of uh, cycles while we're running through the solution. Any questions up to this point? Yeah, AJ. So another way of saying this by what you've done, you've reduced it just to those those borders. Yes. Is that correct? So you've thrown away all that information in the middle. I have, and what's interesting about that is that wasn't my first instinct. My first instinct actually was to, um, so I started out, I took a couple of paths. One was to um, use Gabor filters and actually decompose the image into little, 
little, essentially little tiles, and then um, essentially do a, a, a principal components analysis over these little tiles, and then use that as the basis for determining similarity. But it turned out that there was so much, um, particularly when you get into puzzles with lots of symmetry, that there's so much um, latent similarity between pieces, even though they aren't truly adjacent, and it was hard to pull out the order properties of, of the problem that way. I then decided, well, what if um, instead of taking the whole image, what if I have a sort of a, a growing band around, around the piece? And so you can think about um, computing each edge or treating each edge not as a, not as a single line, but as a, as, a, as a rectangle, and then computing the pairwise similarities by the edges of the rectangles. And even that um, introduced too many uh, spurious matches. So interestingly enough, it was just the single, the single vector along each edge that, that performed optimally. And from an information theory perspective, that does, that does make sense when you really get down and think about it, but um, it took a number of iterations to, to get to that point. Uh, that was a great question, thank you. Any other questions? I will post it on GitHub. I'm gonna clean up a little bit of uh, material. Typically, if I give a talk, I like to use people's feedback based on their questions to, uh, to clean things up and then I'll post it. So um, when we go through and we compute these um, these pairwise uh, these pairwise dissimilarities between all the pieces, um, a great way just to kind of get an idea of what's going on and how everything is connected within the puzzle is to actually um, visualize the um, visualize the matrix that we store the data in. So here we can see that we have a lot of um, regular structure and that it is um, it's actually it's symmetrical, which is what we would expect. And we can also visualize the matrix of, um, of orientation. So um, we coded this up as uh, 0, 1, 2, and 3. Um, and that's what, that's what you see here. So we end up with this really interesting um, you know, block topology that, that comes out within the, uh, within the problem as it is. So now that we have a way of determining how similar things are, um, we can start asking questions like, um, how do, you, how do you find a solution? So the initial stab at this, um, and I've seen a few papers on, on this topic where people um, develop some heuristics around using um, uh, minimum, minimum spanning trees and degree constrained minimum spanning trees for solving these problems. Um, frankly, they were a little hacky. Um, and so um, I thought that this, this approach, um, even though it's computationally pretty intensive, that I think it leads to a much more elegant, uh, elegant formalism. So at a high level, the way genetic algorithms operate um, really follows this, um, this, this flow, which I shamelessly pulled off the internet, and I will, I will attribute it in the, final, in the final thing that goes online. But um, basically, what happens is um, we generate a set of initial random populations. Those random populations are just configurations of the puzzle. So if you think about um, every piece in a, in a simple puzzle being numbered, we're essentially, if so, if we have one through nine in this case, all the possible um, ran orderings um, would represent a um, would represent an initial population. So when we randomly generate a, a population of solutions, and we can generate hundreds of random solutions, we can generate thousands, tens of thousands. It really is problem problem dependent, and we can calculate the fitness of those of those individuals and i'll get into more of the details of how we do this but basically the fitness of an individual looks at the total amount of edge dissimilarity of the resulting solution so we basically can plug in our configuration um, plug in the random solution or the you know the, the chromosome and into our dis our pairwise dissimilarity matrix and then look at um, look at all the edges that are that are preserved there and then add up the dissimilarity and once you do that, once you calculate the fitness of all the possible individuals um, that are generated initially, then um, you get into the process where you take random combinations, you split the data set into um, uh, male and female chromosomes, and then you have a process whereby we combine bits and pieces of their solutions. So if um, you know, the mother chromosome has um, you know, two pieces um, that, are minimal, that have a minimum distance to each other and, it has them, and has them adjacent to one another, 
then uh, we want to preserve that information. Likewise, if the father has some um, highly compatible stretch or they have a really well built out piece, that um, we want to try to find a way to combine those two solutions together in a way that has um, that is more fitness than either parent on their own. And um, another way that we can also um, sort of probe the problem space is through the idea of mutation. And what mutation does with, within this context is it essentially takes a, a potential candidate solution and it jumbles it up in some, in some way in order to introduce diversity into the population of candidate solutions. So we go through this process of, of generating a population, combining the parents together in a way that is um, hopefully um, you know, representative of the, of the complexity of the problem, evaluating the offspring, and then doing it all over again. And you repeat that process until um, you either hit some you know, definite criterion or um, you, you run out of patience, basically. So in terms of the, the actual representation of, of this problem, one way that we can think about it is as a tr sort of traveling salesman problem with, with which you know, any MP complete problem can be mapped back into, you know, back into one another. But this, um, essentially what we're trying to do is we're trying to find a path through a network of pieces that, um, that, that is minimal and minimizes the total amount of uh, configuration error. So um, piece one is connected to piece two, to piece three, um, six, five, and so on. If you were to actually solve this, treat this as a, as a strict traveling salesman problem, what you would have to do is introduce a, uh, a phantom piece. So a phantom piece that has uh, minimal error to the beginning piece and the end piece in order to create, in order to close the loop, essentially, which I, which I think is kind of, kind of fun, a kind of fun way to think about it. But um, just by looking at this little, this little schematic, you kind of get an idea of really what the, what the complexity is here, that we're not, just, we're not just saying that we need to connect you know, pieces to each other, but we have to preserve orientation, order, and order while minimizing overall, overall error. So um, you know, from an optimization standpoint, there is no smooth error, there's no smooth error function over all these combinations that we can evaluate, and there's no... You know, we only know that we have the right solution once we found it, which is, which is interesting. So let's get into the meat of how we actually put this thing together. So an individual in this case is really simple. If we know the length of the puzzle, so if it's, if it's uh, five by five, the each, each possible solution is gonna have length 25. And so we'll just generate a sequence from, uh, well in this case, zero to 24. Um, and then we'll shuffle it, and then we'll return that as a as a potential as a individual. And and so in this case, we see um, you know we just get a random uh, a random um, permutation of of that vector. Then um, when we get into actually saying uh, what is the fitness of this solution, what's the fitness of this individual? Um, we have to do two things. One, we have to actually map backwards from this um, vectorized representation back into a matrix representation. That way we can uh, shoehorn that into our existing error function and then um, and evaluate that what's, um, what's the total distance, you know, sum of distances or dissimilarities in the, in the problem. So we have this function um, individual to edge list. All this does is it initializes a, um, it takes an individual and then it um, decomposes it into the set of um, adjacent um, of uh, adjacent pieces and then returns a list of, of edges that are, that are um, represented by that individual. Once we have that edge list, then those edges are just coordinates in our error matrix, right? And so um, all we have to do is just iterate through that list of individuals and then, and then sum, up the, sum up the total dissimilarity. And that tells us how good a potential candidate solution is. Another interesting thing about, about this approach to the problem is that rather than, um, we're not really treating it as, a, as an image convergence or similarity problem. We're not starting out presupposing that we know um, what, the exact, um, you know, what the exact solution looks like we're purely descending on the, you know, trying to minimize, you know, minimize this function. Um, we don't have a scorecard that says, you know, you have the perfect configuration, so, because we're not referencing against the original image. We're taking the raw pieces 
in an unordered in an unordered state, and then trying to find the solution that has the best configuration in terms of uh, you know minimal distance, but with no no other prior knowledge. So once we know how to generate an individual, once we know how to say how fit that individual is from an evolutionary standpoint, we can then generate a whole population of, of these individuals. And that's as simple as if we know how many, if we know how big the initial population is that we, that we want to generate, then, um, then we just loop over that, generate a, a random set, and, um, and we call that our initial, our initial population. Once we have that population, we can also compute what the average fitness of that population is, um, and that's a great way of tracking the overall convergence of the algorithm. Okay, it's probably a good, good time for questions. Does anybody have any questions to this point? All right. Okay, see that all right? So once we have a set of, um, once we have an initial population, now we have to breed them, right? We have to, com we have to find a way to combine the, um, each of these random solutions together in a way that, um, that pushes, the, you know, pushes the path forward in, in solving this problem. Traditionally, most genetic algorithms don't have the types of um, topological constraints that we, that we have in this case. Um, in this case, we're, we're dealing with orientation. We're not just searching for a set of, 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 of you know, finitely tunable parameters. We have um, multiple scales of complexity here. And so we're not able to just take two, random, take two parents, randomly swap you know, some positions, and then call it a day. We have to um, construct the solution um, or, or combine the parents in such a way that preserves the parts of the solution that are, that are known to be working. And then, um, and then handles the rest on a on a case by case basis. So um, we do this in two parts, actually three parts. Uh, so we have a function called edge pairs. What what this does is this looks at um, it's similar to our other function, which took some, which took an individual and created an edge list. In this case, we're not just computing an edge list. We're also um, and and we're also extracting out the orientation and um, the relative um, positions within, within the puzzle of, of each of the pieces. And then we'll use that information later on when we're trying to piece, you know, piece the parents together. Then we have a function called update, update boundary. So what a boundary is, is if we, if we take two parents and we say that you know, the mother piece has a little segment that Clearly is a good is clearly a good solution because it has it because it has minimal pairwise error, and then father has a section of maybe three or four contiguous pieces that is that are clearly you know locked together. That what we're doing is we're com that we first will take those pieces and we'll randomly throw them into a child in a way that doesn't collide with the um, with the, the so the two pieces don't collide, and then um, once we have that we say that's sort of our initial solution, and then. Um, Basically, for all the slots that are left in the piece, we look for um, boundaries where you have a, a, a known piece that, that's found. So let's say it's piece one. We don't know what piece one is, is compatible with, but we know where it is currently in the puzzle. So we'll then look through our, our error matrix, or our um, dissimilarity matrix, and then find the piece that is most compatible to one. And so we'll do that. It's called a greedy optimization. We're essentially going through every open slot. Once we combine the parents, we go through every open slot in the puzzle and then just find its nearest neighbor and then fill in the gaps randomly um, if we can't find a solution after two or three, two or three iterations. At that point, um, that's everything we need in order to um, actually complete the crossover operation. So this here sort of summarizes what I just said. We take the male and the female. We generate a, a child of um, empty positions. So we just say that the uh, children are in position um, position negative one. Um, and so negative one is not a position in this case, but it's just, it's just a placeholder. And then um, whatever parts of the parents that are matching, we assign those to the child. If there are no matches at all, so it's it's a complete mismatch. We just seed the solution with uh, with a random you know with a random placement from the parents. In this case, we just take it's like taking a rib out of the father and creating a, creating the child. 
and then um, and then at that point, we know that the um, that the total solution to the problem has to have all pieces from zero to 24. So if we were to sum all those positions up, we know that that would, in this case, with a five by five puzzle, be equal to 300. So we just simply loop this boundary update step until the child has every position filled. Does that make sense? Any questions? Okay. So with that, we can define, we can take all of these pieces together and define the evolutionary cycle. So what happens here is that first we take, we take the population, and this could either be the, um, the previous population um, or the initial population. We evaluate their fitness. We split the population up, so we, we sort them by fitness, and then if we say that we're gonna retain 20%, then we take the, um, the most fit 20%, we kill off all the other solutions. Those become our parents. Um, we then will randomly select some of the other parents um, in order to increase um, the genetic ver diversity in the population. And then um, at some, with, with some other low probability, in this case we have it um, default to uh, you know, a 5% five, five chance, that we will randomly mutate an individual. The way we mutate individuals is also important here in that we don't want to um, we wanted to create a type of mutation that didn't destroy good solutions. So if there are contiguous streams of pieces, rather than um, taking the risk of, you know, uh, of pulling a good piece out at a, at a position where we might need it, what we do instead is we actually roll the solution. So we, we basically shift it in place around so contiguous pieces are most likely to stay together rather than be um, bro broken apart. And then we iterate, and we we cross over and then create the next generation, and just keep doing it until um, until we exhaust the, the total number of uh, of generations. So in this uh, little demonstration, we say that um, we want to create an initial population of 1,000 candidate solutions. From those 1,000 candidate solutions, we want to um, have 50, 50 cycles of, of evolution. And we, at that point, we want to make sure that every generation retains the top 40% of parents. We're going to randomly throw in uh, parents at a 5% odds, and then we're going to mutate with, with one with, at 1%. And so we will evolve a population, we'll compute its average fitness, We'll save that. We can also save the intermediate images um, that are, are the intermediate puzzle configurations as they occur, and then we just loop. So we can see um, for our starry night example, we start out pretty high, and then we converge down to some minimal error, and you start to get, um, you know, the incremental differences become pretty, pretty slow at that point. So here we go. So this is the solution. So we went from random configuration to, in this case, perfectly solved in 50 iterations, which is pretty good. Um, and so, for for the sake of uh, for the sake of comparison, I, I chose without changing a whole lot. I just wanted to be able to see what the um, what sort of variations you get out of the box without doing a whole lot of customization. What would happen, let's take, let's take another image. Oh, one important piece I forgot here. Um, so another thing that we can do, um, which is often very helpful in understanding the nature of the, of the problem and, and its solution, so we can actually track the fitness over, over each um, iteration. So over all 50 iterations, we see that we start to slowly slowly um, converge to, um, to a better solution, then we, had, we hit a plateau for some period of time. At some point, a mutation probably happened um, in, the, in, our, in our cycle that, um, that propagated very quickly um, over a short number of cycles, and we get another plateau, and then another, and then, then another you know, acceleration of evolution, and until we, hit, um, until we basically hit a bottom and we don't, uh, we don't move anymore. In this case, because we did find a perfect solution, it's unlikely that we would have any movement beyond, beyond that. So for the sake of variety, um, picked another image. In this case, um, took a, a problem with uh, pictures of uh, kittens. 
and so we generate our puzzle. And without, with keeping the exact same parameters, we see we get a very good solution. We solve the, really the most important part of it, but then we have a whole block up here at the top that, that remains unsolved. So I think this is actually interesting to see. Um, I like to find these types of counterexamples and, and problems where you don't actually want it to work perfectly every, every time. You want to understand why it fails and when it fails. And if we think about what, what's happening in this, in this picture and the most likely reason that it's, that it's failing is that one, there's a high degree of symmetry in this problem. With the starry night, there's a tremendous amount of, of asymmetry that every, that every one of the edges is likely to be highly unique. In this image, there's a, there's a high degree of redundancy, right? So because of that, because of that redundancy, um, what can happen as you're evolving, as you're evolving a solution, is that you can get stuck in a local in a local optima, and um, unless you want to get really fancy with how you're dynamically adjusting your mu your mutation rates, you're going to basically get into a configuration and you're going to stay there, and the solution is not going to be able to pop out um, pop out. And we can actually see that see that here. So we we have the same trajectory of of evolution where. You know, we quickly decay, we plateau, quickly decay, and then plateau. But here, we don't have the same sort of level, level, smooth leveling out that we had with the with the other problem. And I think that's because we, um, because of this, um, you know, symmetry symmetry problem that comes up. <clears throat> and then another another one. We have a Yorkie, so uh, decided to throw in a Yorkie picture. So create the Yorkie puzzle, and we can see its solution. And you have the same problem because of the because of the um, underlying symmetry in the um, in the image, and so there are a number of things that we could do about this. We could dynamically adjust the um, the mutation parameters. We could dynamically adjust the um, the total population size in order to escape from 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 uh, local minima in our in our solution. But um, I think for a uh, for really what amounts to a, a proof of concept of the of the solution, I think. Uh, even with a fairly simple system is, is actually doing pretty pretty darn well, all things considered. And you can expand the total number of puzzle pieces. Um, and let, if you uh, if you want to blow some EC2 credits, I'm sure you could uh, uh, get a pretty beefy GPU instance that would be able to uh, that be able to plow through all these uh, combinations pretty quickly. But um, even with you know fairly commodity hardware, I mean we're talking about and the total number of combinations that have to be evaluated here in the brute force solution would be, you know, untenable. But, you know, for what you can do even with a MacBook Pro, um, you know, two, uh, two generations removed, it's, it's pretty good. So, I mean, that's the, that's the meat of it. Um, I figure, do you, what questions do, does everybody have? Yes, possibly, possibly. I didn't want to. <laughs> well, actually, it was, I didn't want to, and I also didn't, um, I would much rather be able to deal with a, um, with a single dimensional vector for, for grayscale rather than having to deal with RGB, RGB data. But we, we could certainly do that. Yes? Uh, about two or three minutes. So it's not too bad for, fif for 50 generations. And then it took for um, for 10 by 10. It took about 20 minutes, so definitely, definitely, uh, it was uh, getting kind of hot, and the fans were fans were blowing pretty hard. Well, um, execution time will definitely go down tremendously um, in, in the number of, of parents that you have. The total calculation time in terms of, mut of mutation rate doesn't, doesn't change. The only way that would change is if you dynamically were controlling the, um, so in, instead of fixing the number of iterations that you have, like we are here for, simpli for simplicity's sake, if we wanted to create a dynamic solution, then it, um, if we were tracking conversions like we were with something like a, even simple like a bisection or Newton's algorithm, um, then yeah, you could probably cut off a, a considerable number of, of a considerable number of iterations if you were to do something like that. The odds of finding a solution, um, yeah. So so those are essentially mixing mixing rates. 
So if you realize that, um, and that's why it's important to look at your, um, your, your fitness convergence over time. If you see that you're getting stuck in a minima um, somewhere, then, then that tells me that I need to increase my mutation rate. And so those are, if you wanted to go through an exhaustive exercise and, um, and look at, you know, exactly given, uh, given problems with the, with a, or puzzle pieces with a certain amount of, um, of entropy, what, what the optimal, you know, combination is and then solve from there. Um, but then you're getting into the same sort of brute force approach that you would otherwise have to take if you just wanted to brute force it with like minimum spanning trees or something. Oh, could you come to the mic? In, in your example here, you have images to kind of give you feedback on the goodness of your fit. Um, if you were trying to do it a genetic algorithm where you didn't have that kind of feedback, so let's say you wanted to tune hyperparameters or build a deep, uh, uh, model structure using a genetic algorithm, would you then have to go further down the brute force path of kind of um, uh, adjusting your optimization rate or, opti or your mutation rate to kind of get an intuition on how, if you were in a local minimum or if you mm -hmm. had converged or not? Yeah, you probably would have to do that. Um, and one of the areas of, of research that I've been actively pursuing, um, not necessarily with genetic algorithms, but would fit well into this, is actually using um, something called persistent homology. And looking at the um, looking at the convergence in terms of the topology of of a, of a projected solution, rather than look trying to look at the properties of the hyperparameters themselves, if that makes sense. So basically, if you if you understand something about what the topology of your solution should look like, sometimes it's um, that gives you stronger guarantees than just purely converging off of some error, some you know, arbitrary error function. And so you can employ something like that in in a case like this, or if you're trying to look at like node configurations in a you know, in a more complex, you know, interesting, um, uh, like if you're trying to train, a, you know, a neural net architecture or something like that, you could do that. Hey, Tyler. Um, yes. Did you look at all about the relative time that is captured by doing the constraint? Can you so, can sorry, you so because you did, you did the, in this particular case, you wanted to constrain the boxes in this configuration sort of thing. Uh -huh. um, did you have a sense of like how much that added to the computation time that you would have if you had a simpler genetic algorithm, you know, simpler problem you're trying to solve? So I was actually never able to convert, uh, converge to a workable solution without preserving, without preserving the order information. Um, so I wanted, I wanted to try to get away with that and, and see, but um, I tried a couple of different, a couple of different ways, and could never, could never come up with something. And I think what, I think what's happening there is because there are so many possible configurations, that you really do need that orientation information to constrain the, the potential solution. Without those constraints, um, you're really getting into brute force territory. I wish I could have done that. So for that problem that he was just talking about, couldn't you have it so you use caddy corner comparing? So you have, if you could go up to the traveling salesman diagram just so I can have numbered squares, that'd be great. It's kind of far up, sorry. Oh, that's all right. <coughs> so if you compare one to two and one to four and have a sort of match, you can make a relationship between two and four with five if you compare five to two and five to four. So couldn't you do that with orientation? I do do that. And this that's what you tried? Yeah, so we actually do do that. We consider all possible um, orientations. We're not just considering left and, and down. Um, this is just a diagram to kind of give you an idea of what the ideal flow of the, prob of the problem should right. be. But when we get down, let's see, I'll show you. So here. Um, we, we consider every possible um, configuration. So we have, um, in this case, this is right, left, top, and bottom ori um, orientations, pairwise orientations. And so we have a constraint here when we're updating the boundary that um, when we're evaluating an empty when we're evaluating an empty position, given a reference piece, we identify its sorted set of neighbors by minimal error. 
but then when we're choosing whether or not to um, add uh, or to consider a particular combination as a result, we have two additional constraints that we have to add. One is that the um, that this nearest neighbor is um, not currently in the solution, and the other is that its orientation matches the required orientation um, of the problem. So in this case, we are capable of handling four um, four wise um, configurations, not just the not just a simple two degree path. And what was the problem that you ran into when you were trying to do it without already set orientation on uh, some pieces may be sideways or upside down? So, so what happens th if you minimize that is that instead of getting, um, instead of getting a nice you know, overall configuration like this, you'll end up with strips. So each, um, each row here, You'll, you'll, you'll still achieve these rows, or you'll get puzzle pieces, but they'll be jumbled, and, and the order is not, um, you know, the, the, the hierarchical order is not, is not preserved. So it's sort of a solution, but it doesn't get you at the global solution. Yeah. No, that, that was kind of that was kind of weird when I was working through it. I'm like, why the heck is this happening? And I actually realized that I forgot to do the other the other part. And then as soon as I figured that out, I was able to get you know the total configuration right. Any questions? All right. Well, thank you, thank you everybody for uh, for coming and listening. Thank you very much.